Welcome back to A People's Guide to Publishing. I'm Joe Beal, the founder and CEO of Microcosm Publishing and Distribution. I'm also the author of A People's Guide to Publishing, which distills what I've learned from selling millions of books over the past 25 years. I'm Ellie Blue. I'm the Editorial and Marketing Director here at Microcosm. We are an independent midlist publisher based in Portland, Oregon. We have 14 employees, over 650 titles in print with 20 to 40 new books per year, and we distribute thousands of titles from other publishers. We started this podcast so that we can share what we've learned with newer publishers so that you can learn from our mistakes. Or maybe you just want to understand the publishing industry. This week, we are going to talk about things that we disagree about, Ugh. if we can find any. <laughs> <laughs> we disagree all the time. I don't know that we ever have. It's non-stop. Well, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, you're right. It might have Wait, happened before, but I really wrong, doubt right. it. <laughs> it seems very unlikely. I mean, okay, to be like very serious, we are often on the same page. And the reason I wanted to do this episode is because sometimes on this podcast, it feels like, you know, Joe says something and I'm like, that's right. And I say something and he's like, that's right. Well, occasionally he's like, that's actually wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's like a matter of like factuality. Semantics not um core disagreement mm. so, i was just trying to disagree but <laughs> lest you all think that we are always on the same page or worse just like you know blowing smoke up each other's asses we're each other's shill it's pretty awesome <laughs> i mean it's good to present a united front we're both taking occasions. applications to have more people that disagree with us all the time if anybody knows anyone I would say our disagreements Wait, we're not? Is that what you're are often the fuel of some of our best decisions. Mm, that's true. That's true. Or at least some of our most rousing and fun conversations. Such as publishing on Fuck Your Brain. Mm -hmm. I know. I didn't I didn't see the value from the proposal and Joe did. <laughs> that was that was a great disagreement. And I I mean I feel like so we do often disagree about what books we should publish, but I don't want to talk about most of them because like you actually do have the upper hand in this situation so we've there are books out there I that we've published no that i disagree with upper hand <laughs> mm. as i the way that i put it when i was uh when i was teaching you know i, I explained it in the sense of the like i have the final say over what we publish however that is largely immaterial because if there isn't buy-in from the staff and if well, let's face it, if a book is unmarketable, then a book is unmarketable, and, like, no author wants their book published that, like, you know, doesn't do anything, and then it's just, like, an incredible roller coaster of feelings that doesn't end anywhere good. But there are a lot of, like, incredibly marketable books that I find personally repellent, like, look at what Simon & Schuster's Right Wing imprint publishes. Very marketable. Very repellent. I think that's an independent press distributed by Simon & Schuster. Oh. I don't think. Not to disagree, but... I think they do have a right-wing imprint, no, though. No, they Maybe don't. Maybe I'm thinking of Penguin Random House. So I you mean, disagree all the time. It, well, that's not really a disagreement. That's like... A that's debate. like factually <laughs> supported information. But <laughs> So, I mean, a lot of these... And, you know, and this is sort of the... When Simon & Schuster did attempt to... There's a factual minutia of thread in what you're saying. So when Simon & Schuster attempted to publish Milo Yiannopoulos, that was when the world rebelled and they were like, no, right-wing ideologue wingnuts belong on right-wing ideologue wingset presses. They do not belong on major publishers. Mm -hmm. And then um, you're maybe thinking of, you know, the variety of people who were uh, published by Oh, it's Hesha I'm thinking of. They have that Main Street imprint. Well, they did, and now they that... They fired the editor. Yeah. I after mean, it's a recent seen... controversy. And it's, so it's kind of the thing... I mean, I was listening to a podcast that was not our own the other day, and that one had a piece about, you know, the one of the um, hosts used to work at Oxford and talked about the process of, like, all the scientific books that, that, like, Oxford would receive pitches for. And the publishers would deem a book marketable, but then it wouldn't pass peer review because the facts in the book would be wrong or, like, it just would be written by, like, a person that was not of academia, so they didn't know the current research or sometimes what they were talking about. And then they, they would 
see those same books that would get published by other presses and then see them on the shelf and then know that all the information in the book was wrong you know and to think of like you know so i think like there's definitely that sort of problem and um the way they focused the you know the frame around it was like when you think about a book that will sell you have to really you know this is how you end up with all these like you know, Matt Gates will probably have his book out in a year about how, you know, the left was out to get him <laughs> and hacked see, his Venmo account. Can I bring us back to the topic at no. hand, which is things that we disagree about? <laughs> no, you may not. So, like, we can disagree about the marketability of a book, and one that mean, one of us is right and one of us is wrong, but we, I feel like the tr true disagreement is when, like, one of us thinks the book is amazing and the other person is like, eh, I don't like that at all, you know? Mm -hmm. and then, I mean, to me, it's normally like I will allow anything, you know, I will stand aside through any decision where I'm like, I do not see the merit or value of this, but I can recognize at least that it has an audience and it's like highly marketable work. And it fits within our mission. Yeah, even if it's yeah. not for me. I know. And I think we've both had to kind of be in that role of stepping back and being like, I'm going along with this one, mm -hmm. despite my disagreements, mm -hmm. not naming names. Like, anyway. and I don't really care, you know, I mean, I care what we publish, but I don't care. It doesn't always have to be to your taste. Yeah, many years have gone by since every book we published was to my taste. What else do we disagree about? Nothing. So, um... You brought this up, actually, last time we talked about it. Uh, we often have disagreements about that line between fiction and nonfiction. Where does that fall? No, we don't. <laughs> oh, we do we ever. Yeah, so I suppose, and it's kind of the thing where, to me, you know, I once suffered through a publisher meeting where people, like, wanted to vehemently argue that as soon as you change the names of real people, then a book is no longer a memoir, even if it follows the form and function of a memoir otherwise, which I just, like, couldn't do anything but roll my eyes, where I'm like, once you're, like, putting that kind of hard and fast rules on something, it's like you're really taking the fun and the point out of publishing, which is, like, expanding people's worldview and imaginations and concept of things. I feel like there's something to be said for intellectual honesty, though. Oh, yeah. Intellectual and, like, honesty. you know, changing the names so you don't get sued or, like, you know, so people don't get doxxed or whatever. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Doesn't... I don't... I feel like that doesn't make things fiction, but I do think that my line for what is fiction is much closer than your line. Well, I think it's just your... I think you, having worked as a reporter, have, see sort of a different set of criteria whereas to me you know when i'm making that distinction i'm like okay did these things really happen is this person excluding facts that would take away from their narrative or are they telling the story to the truth of how they know it not just the truth of how they want to see it and you know and that is ultimately you know and sometimes you will construct things for comedic effect, but you won't, you know, you're, you're fundamentally telling the truth. But like by your definition, um, historical fiction could be nonfiction. No, if it was like really the person wasn't researched. there. They, how would they know? Lots of nonfiction is written by people who weren't there. They do reporting on it after they research it. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but it's, you have firsthand sources, you have like strong accounts, you know, I mean, I get, and it's the, part of that is the difference, the way I see it is like, even into the 1800s, even the 1900s, the New York Times would often like, write a reporting story in a way that was in no way factually accurate, you know, to sort of make it more interesting. That doesn't make it nonfiction. <laughs> right. But it was, you know, the rule and the order of the day. And, you know, and I think that's sort of like how things are shifting and perceptions are changing. I completely disagree. You don't <laughs> think that that was happening then? Or you, you don't think that the rules have changed in the last hundred years? I don't think that a lot of the things that you call nonfiction are nonfiction. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I guess it depends if they actually happened or not. And uh, my account of this argument will 
be very non-fictional. I'm sure it will. I mean, I do like that you're, like, inclined to, um, I appreciate that you're, like, willing to find the truth in things, whereas I'm a little bit more skeptical and I'm always looking for where the lie is. I, I find the fiction, too. I mean, I had an event this week where someone kind of told me some stories and then when I went and I evaluated all those stories, I found that they were not quite all true. Ooh. And... You know, they weren't false, but there were, you know, they were maybe like viewing the world through rose colored glasses. So you're like, that was their truth at that time, but like, that doesn't mean I need to fall for it, you know? And there was a time when I kind of just accepted people at their word and didn't thoroughly fact check those kind of statements. And, you know, you pay the price for that. And, you know, so nowadays I do think of it in terms of like, you know, I have skepticism, but it's also like, and I'm back and forth where I'm, I think about, like, the various issues of Comet Bus where he will, like, simplify a number of his, like, former roommates into one character or mm -hmm. he'll do things like that for the simple f purpose of storytelling and he doesn't, like, frame it as fiction or non-fiction, you know, mm. to sort of get around the question of, like, is this real? That makes me so uncomfortable. <laughs> but, you know, it's like at the end of the day, like, when you don't put yourself in that kind of box and you're just telling a story and the story is freakishly real i feel like you're just using other people as material at that point like oh sure yeah i mean it just i don't know it feels dishonest dun, to dun, me dun. or like those business parables i freaking hate them where it's like it's shelved under nonfiction because it's a business book but it's like you know like the five dysfunctions of a team it's actually a really good book which pisses me off it's really helpful but it's like i know i hate it when books are helpful <laughs> I want all books to be unhelpful. But you know what pisses me off is when an author will pitch us a book that is like events they've lived through, but they will have it f fictionalized, meaning they changed the names, and their logic is forever that they don't want to upset the living people that were party to those events, as if those living people wouldn't realize yeah. that this fictional book is about them. They know. They trust me. They know. And as if it makes any difference at all. I know. I think people want to be, like, artistic about it, too. I don't know. Or maybe... Yeah. The pretension doesn't help me either, but mm. it is what it is. And this is not just an academic argument, by the way. We have at least two books where literally we had, like, fights in the office about whether we should assign fiction or nonfiction by sex to them. And it's, you know, part of that is, like, a marketability question. It's, like, where are people going <sighs> to find it? Where are they going to, like, That's you know, so how is the right person? Well, it's what it is, though, is, like, mm -hmm. you're trying to put, like, the only reason any of those things exist is so the book finds its audience. So Thanks for joining us once again. Please send your questions to podcast at microcosmpublishing.com so we can answer them on future episodes. And please give us five stars on iTunes and everywhere else that podcasts are reviewed. You can find us on the internet at microcosm.pub. On Twitter at microcosm. On Facebook at microcosm publishing. On Instagram at microcosm underscore pub. And here in Portland, Oregon on North Williams Avenue. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week.